Well, ladies and gentlemen, I was going to say a very warm welcome, but um, maybe I'll just leave it at a, a welcome. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a particular welcome to our Battle of the Atlantic veteran, uh, Dennis, here in the front row. My name is Commodore Phil Waterhouse. Oh, you're in trouble then for the rest of the night, I'm afraid. My name is Commodore Phil Waterhouse and I delight in being the Royal Navy's Regional Commander for the North of England and the Isle of Man. I also delight in being the Vice Chairman of the Battle of the Atlantic 80 Committee and have won the wonderful honour of introducing our first lecture. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be here in St Nick's along with my friends from the Battle of the Atlantic charity from Big Heritage and from the Battle of the Atlantic commemorations team as we kick off the BOA 80 lecture series. Led by Battle of the Atlantic Memorial Charity and Big Heritage, over the last seven years or so, we've forged a very close relationship between those that fought the battle and their successors in order to tell the story of the Battle of the Atlantic, a battle famously fought from the headquarters across and down a bit from the back of the church garden. We've achieved much in those seven years, not least in hosting a series of sessions and dignitaries here in Liverpool, and notably that has included seagoing veterans of the Battle of the Atlantic, but also some of those that worked in other areas of the battle. Now let's have a brief reminder by way of a short film commissioned by BOA 80 of that battle and its people. All the ships that were escorted in were absolutely laden with planes, tanks, everything, ammunition, voyages of heroism. Churchill said, I'd forgotten how broad was the sea. I never did. Haunted my dreams that water, a cruel sea. I remember more about the Atlantic Ocean as a natural hazard to seafarers, as well as the wartime part. I used to go down to the pier head. I'd stand and watch the water lapping the seawall. And I'd think, maybe that wave there touched his ship. Maybe he watched it as it flowed back to me. And I'd pray, keep him safe, bear him up. Don't drag him down. You've seen these ships being hit. And within a matter of about four or five minutes, pff, down they've gone. And you think, so, oh God, yeah, all them men. I am here because I was never torpedoed. Obviously, a lot were torpedoed. I'm just lucky I, the ships I was in managed to get away with it. I really am here. I'm sorry. I'm here for my people who can't be here. I'm, I'm lucky to be where I am now and then to have the luck and the privilege to be their representative today. I pray to the water like an idiot for those in peril. One of the biggest coups we've had in BOA 80 is securing tonight's VIP guest as a speaker. In a routine exchange of correspondence between old shipmates, Vice Admiral Sir Clive Johnson, then still serving as a modern day equivalent of Admirals Percy Noble and Max Horton as the NATO CNC for the Atlantic, fell for my patter and became our vice patron. So very briefly, a quick resume of the career of the man who stands before you. A graduate of Shrewsbury School, Durham University and Britannia Royal Naval College, 
Vice Admiral Johnson has deployed to most points of the compass with the Royal Navy and has served as a navigator, a fighter controller, and a principal warfare officer in ships ranging from minesweepers to aircraft carriers. He has been engaged, engaged in operations in the North Atlantic, the Caribbean, the Gulf, the Indian Ocean, the Balkans, the Eastern Mediterranean, and the Northern Gulf, the Horn of Africa, and off Lebanon. He has commanded HMS Iron Duke, a Type 23 frigate, and HMS Bulwark, an amphibious assault ship, and routinely the Royal Navy's flagship. Ashore, he has worked in procurement, in resources, and operational planning, in personal strategy, in the Naval Staff and the MOD. In 2008, he was selected to be the Principal Staff Officer to the Chief of the Defence Staff. On promotion to flag rank, he served as ACNS and Flag Officer Sea Training. And on promotion to Vice Admiral, he assumed command of the NATO Allied Maritime Command in October 2015. Departing the Royal Navy on completion of that appointment, he has stayed in the maritime environment as a corporate strategic lead for the maritime technology company BMT. In 2021, he also assumed chairmanship of the Naval Review. Now with such a varied and importantly for us operations focused career, we are delighted that he has accepted our challenge to deliver the first BOA 80 lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Clive Johnson with the BOA 80 Naval Review Lecture. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank goodness I'm here. I was very worried as, as I was mic'd up that I was going to be doing an audition for the Eurovision. Uh, I, I've neither got my mankini on me or my Thor outfit, so we're lucky, thank God. Phil, uh, Phil is one of my dearest and oldest friends, so he's full of blather. Um, it's lovely to be here, ladies and gentlemen, and for those watching on live stream, thank you very much for taking the moment. It's not a nice day here in Liverpool, as it is across the country, so I'm grateful for your time. Now, my speech is a relatively dark one because we're in a worrying space with everything that's happening in Ukraine and in China and in Iran and elsewhere, but it's one of optimism as well because I think we are starting to learn that we need to work together very much in the spirit that they had in Percy Noble's headquarters down the road and we are just starting to listen to diversity in the way perhaps we haven't done before. And on the day of International Women's Day, I'll just reference that a couple of times. Listening to the right people, not necessarily the people like me, is probably really quite important. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for the time. I confess I'm a lifelong red, um, and Sunday was a good day, um, wasn't it? Gosh, I couldn't believe, after half time, that just changed, just restored your faith. And if you're a blue, I'm sorry, you're having a tough season. Um, you know, I feel your pain a little bit because it's not been a great one for us. I also love Liverpool because of that connection Phil told you about. My headquarters based down in Northwood was a, was a, um, a child of what Percy Noble set up here in Liverpool. Um, now manned by uh, 29 different nations, but actually if you go down the hole as we did every day, and you replaced my lovely plasma digital screens with the chalkboards and plots that they had in 1940. It's almost exactly the same. I could sit in Percy Horton's chair and feel as though I did, I did exactly when we were worrying about Crimea, exactly as we were when we were worrying about the migrants. So, you know, things don't change that much. I'm also you know, really proud to be here in St. Nick's. As you all know, St. Nick's has been here since the 13th century in one guise or the other. I think I'm right in saying the tower is from about the 18th century and the whole church was rebuilt in, in about 1950. But it is the Sailors' Church. And you can look at Sailors' in one of two ways. Either we're a bunch of mongrels and pirates or we are a lovely reflection of the diversity of people who occupy the sea. And I think it's a fitting place to be talking about understanding so Crispin and, and all your team, thank you very much for your hospitality. I appreciate it. I do also note that understanding is important. And on this day of International Women's Day, I'd just like to congratulate those who are champions for diversity and, and for difference. I am a very proud champion of Stonewall. And I've learned more talking to people in Stonewall. And I've learned more to my two very opinionated 20-something daughters than ever I've had in my naval career. 
I was thinking about something recently, so I started to read a bit about Emily Pankhurst, um, because I've not really ever come up, you know, I'm a bloke, I'm a Luddite, I've never really read what the suffragettes were all, all about. And, and there is a lovely quote, which I absolutely recognize now, when corporately we're desperate for talent and the Royal Navy is short of people. And Emily, Emily Pankhurst said, we have to free half the human race, the women, so that they can free up the other half. Now, forget women and forget men, but talk talent. What foresight she had. So it's lovely to be here in Crispin's hospitality. And finally, with very great respect, I note that we are here to commemorate a Battle of Atlantic 80. And if I may mo make a moment, Mr. Dennis Rose, sir, uh, uh, being here on behalf of all those who fought and died with you, it is of great respect for us to have you here. Thank you very much for taking the trouble to be here. And thank you very much for representing everybody and reminding us of how important that is. My father-in-law fought at D-Day, um, and he talked to me about his ship, HMS Damsey, so full of blood from pulling people off Utah Beach that when they got to um, Ar the Arizona, they were sent home. They were, in, they were in absolute seismic shock by what they had seen over the last 24 hours. Just to give you a feel for the Battle of the Atlantic, we lost over 36,000 people. That's Navy people. And we lost the same number in Merchant Navy sailors. Let's say that's 80,000 people. That's incalculable. How do you sort of sum up the stoppage of lives of 80,000 people? We lost 175 warships. This is major warships. We lost over 800 aircraft, 3,500 merchant ships. The numbers beg a belief. But we weren't the only ones to suffer. I have some very, very good friends in the German Navy and German policy. And they lost three quarters of their submarine fleet, 30,000 out of 40,000 40, people. Now you add in the staff officers and the clerics and the staff, think how many operational sailors we're going to see at the end of the war and what intense and immense courage they had to have to take a U-boat to sea. Um, and so I reflect their loss just as much as ours. Um, and, and finally, I think it's fitting that we are talking about the Battle of, um, Battle of Britain, sorry, Battle of Atlantic Memorial. It symbolizes quite a lot of work that others have been doing. But it kind of reminded when I saw a quote from Churchill who said in 41 when things were pretty bleak. I see all the da damage but done by enemy attacks, but I also see the spirit. And it's that spirit I want to rotate back to as I go through my speech. Just like the Oscars, I have to thank a few people. Clearly, Crispin for everything he's put on. To Peel Ports, thank you very much, Peel Ports, for being one of the sponsors. Um, to the Naval Review, of which I represent. If you don't know about the Naval Review, please join. Go online and type in Naval Review. It is, it is UK's and probably the world's uh, certainly most historic independent and hopefully best leading independent uh, forum on, on naval matters. Not maritime, but naval matters. That's changing. I also thank my company, BMT. If you haven't heard of us, we're an engineering services company. We design aircraft carriers. We've just won the contract for the three solid support ships. But more than that, we work with MST Group here in Liverpool, uh, with Camel Laird and Birkenhead, and with a host of other companies around the Maritime Mersey cluster, and are intensely and immensely proud of our heritage. And then finally, my thanks to the team who've supported this. To Gary Doyle, thank you very much, who's led this. To my old mate, Phil Waterhouse, who I think is, without doubt, the best naval regional commander in the country. And the very lovely Louise McCourt, who seemed to make this you know, all happen on rails, and I know it's anything but. Um, I was going to give you a slightly exciting, almost Eurovision-esque view of the politics and also the operations that are going on at the moment. You may or may not know that a review of the integrated review is about to publish. It publishes next week. And I spoke to the first Sea Lord, and he's asked me to dial down just very slightly some of the more stories of daring do, <clears throat> only because he's got the Navy in a really good space after a lot of work. And we're not quite sure on live stream who's listening. And, and if, if it is the Chancellor or Richie Sunak, that may not be good for the first sea lord just now. So I've just dialed things down a little bit. Um, but I want to talk about Russia. I want to talk about what Russia means. I want to talk that Ukraine is not about Ukraine at all. It, it's very much more and needs to concern us. And I want to link it to the Battle of Atlantic itself. 
And perhaps in these times, I want to talk about Watu. Who knows what Watu stands for? Who Watu are? Nah. Right. Watu is a bunch of misfits and lepers. They were formed in 1942 when the battle was going wrong. They were formed uh, and they had their uh, offices literally down the road and led by a very odd captain called Gilbert Roberts. Gilbert Roberts couldn't recruit a staff, so he was given a staff of young women. It turned out they were incredibly intelligent, bright, and thoughtful young women. And they were the ones who locked away a bit like a leper colony, started to think about what the, what the German tactics really were and why we weren't beating the Germans. And it was them, those very, very clever young ladies, who started to piece together the battle, I think probably as a man wouldn't do, because a man would stand back and go, oh, I know what that's all about, yeah, it's, it's turn left. And they thought, why are we missing these submarines every single time? And on pieces of parchment, on floors, by inch by inch, they plotted the battles. And they decoded what the battle was and then rebuilt our tactics to make it so. So I want to talk about that and I want to link it through to the present. And why the link? Well, because many believe, um, if you think that 1940 was the second battle of the Atlantic, many of us and many, many policymakers and strategists believe we're fighting the fourth battle of the Atlantic now, and we really are. It's not gunfire, it's not open ASW warfare, anti-submarine warfare, but it's a battle of geography, it really is. It's underwater cables, it's pipeline infrastructure, if you ever know that off Immingham, off Hull, um, there's a huge junction point of lots of pipes for our oil and gas coming in. I mean, an enormous junction, industrial junction. We're now very worried about that junction. Uh, we're very worried about the pipelines around it. We're very worried about the pipelines around the coast of UK because there is malevolence and we need to be careful of it. So issues are different, but history advises us a bit like um, somebody said that it may not be a symphony, but you know, history is a bit of a jazz thing. It echoes and repeats on you. In 1939 and 45, the if the Allies had not kept the trade routes open, then the war across the world would have been won by an Axis, uh, an Axis victory. North America and Europe and elsewhere were de absolutely dependent on American supplies, or the supplies funneling in through America. And there's a rather uncomfortable echo only three years ago when the COVID crisis hit. Remember? You couldn't get toilet paper for love and the money. You couldn't get stuff. We ordered a garden table, and it took us six months to get a garden table. And that's just a wooden garden table. Think of those supply lines. They're coming from China at the moment, but they would come across the Atlantic or the Mediterranean if we needed them. If those closed down, where's our infrastructure to manufacture this stuff? Where's our resilience? We haven't got it anymore. And where we want it, the port infrastructure, where we need to build supply lines, where we need railway stations, just think HS2, it is almost impossible to get the planning and permission to do so, that builds the capacity that gives us a chance to stand on our own two feet. This is something that history has told us, and there's an echo now. If you look at Ukraine, you could think that this is a slightly distant, albeit horrific, uh, war in a Central European country. But it's a dark web stretching very much further than that. On one hand, it's a battle of liberty and global values and, diploma, uh, and, and democracy. And on the other, it is a, uh, a fascinating but terribly frightening oligarch who is driving power with a very small group of people. And this is not a fight against Russia. This is a fight against the Russian regime. But the really scary thing is if Ukraine is successful, because of the lack of controls in Russia, and this is a, a speech given by a good friend of mine, the head of intelligence in Norway, we actually drive ourselves closer to a, a, um, a tactical nuclear conflict because there are ne no longer the control mechanisms that stop Putin escalating for effect. All the old Cold War mechanisms that was a ballet that was very well chore choreographed have gone now. And there's very few people, maybe old dogs like me, who know how, it's work, how it works. 
And that is in, uh, uh, actually, indeed, why I'm still engaged in the Ministry of Defence, helping think through some of these very challenging issues. And threats, ladies and gentlemen, are not binary. They're not just to the east or the south, not just Ukraine or anti-submarine warfare or migration, but they're both persistent and fleeting. And several can, several can and are coming up uh, 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 simultaneously. Indeed, just think about it. Um, just think about the last couple of um, years, really. Threats have been in our backyard. We've had submarines around the Scottish Islands. I've told you about Immingham. We're worried about the North Sea. We're worried about the pipelines. And we've seen a bomb go off on a pipeline crossing the Baltic Sea. All of that makes us feel uncomfortable and then think much closer to home, to Salisbury, where two nationals under our care were poisoned, not quite to death, but very close of it. So how do you deal with this? Well, I like to think about these threats. The, these threats are a bit like a nightmare. It's a bit like playing chess. Now, I can't play chess because I'm a dullard. Checkers is for me or drafts is for me. But imagine playing chess, but on a game of Jenga. You're trying to plot out a strategy, but at any one time, somebody is pulling out the pieces in a way that is uncontrolled, and your chess game can fall apart all at, one, all at once. That is what we're dealing with here. It's not a conventional way of looking at the world. It requires time and investment to understand, and, and frankly, we are behind the curve. We thought after the Cold War we were going into a period of peace. But for all of us, the seas, the oceans, are a new frontier, not like cyber or academia. We're fighting in a new space. I've said we have to fight on many axes, but we will, and therefore successful balance, posture, and messaging is critical to match these challenges. And I think, and I passionately believe this, we need to have a conversation with different people, old people, young people, gay people, straight people, girls, boys, pink, yellow, dotted, spotted, because all of us have, have something of a say about a different way of the world is evolving. And sadly, if you recruit people who are like me, we will get it wrong, I will assure you. We have to have a different input and a different way of thinking. But reading back copies of the Naval Review, I'm the chairman, I'm terribly proud of it, actually, I was struck how familiar these conversations were back in 1940, 1941, when things were dark. Churchill and Eisenhower were stressed out of their box trying to understand what to do um, because everything was going wrong on them. So the lesson from Watu is you do need to sit back and think deeply and broadly and redefine our strategy and our tactics. So it's pertinent now, or pertinent then, it will be pertinent now. I'm afraid competition at sea is not theoretical, it's happening. Putin and his cronies, despite their bizarre, and they are bizarre, missteps in Ukraine, are mobilizing so they maximize their chances to have a greater say in the world. And in a way, I mean, in a bizarre way, you can kind of understand. We got the Russian relationship wrong about 25 years ago. We should have looked after the Russians better than we did. And they're grumpy about it. But they're grumpy in a way that we don't understand because we don't understand them. And I suppose I'm anxious about it, ladies and gentlemen, because Understanding our enemy in this really complex world, and just think how complex it is. Not only is there austerity, but there's the environment. We're cracking our planet, you know, and, and everything else. Um, the political and media instinct is to either simplify or, or make things a catastrophe, to sensationalize it. We don't seem to have the ability to have a long, steady conversation and educate ourselves about all the facets of a problem. You know, I don't want to talk politics, but just think about the Scottish referendum or Brexit and how viscous that got very quickly, rather than a thoughtful, considered debate about how we should do stuff. And everybody's at fault here, but we get led away. Popular, populist assurances say it's their fault or it's easy to fix. You know, and politicians stand up with their top five or top three or top two or top whatever, and you know we'll never see the end of this. I'm afraid that won't do, certainly not in the crisis we're facing now. We need to think about how we coalesce influence and strength. We need to get education and engagement, which is we need to talk to each other. We need to harness uh, universities and academia, John Moores and other brilliant places. 
We need to talk to business, and I've learned this very much in my last three years. And finally, we need to corral policy and politics, which are different, into a way that works. In my view, and this is a genuine view, cities like Liverpool, cities like Glasgow, cities like Manchester, as well as London, have a voice here because you are your own ecosystem and you have your own independent way of thinking. And I think it's really, really important we start to understand things. And I was discussing this with the first sea lord, uh, Sir Ben Key, and we were just chewing the cud, we're all mates. And he said, that's interesting, you're pulling those four together. He was doing a piece of work understanding what the art of the Admiralty is. Peeps in the 16th century had a group of people who planted forests for the oak who thought longer than five years, who thought 100 years, who thought 200 years, so that the country was stable 200, 200 years' time. And Ben is trying to think about what the art of the Admiralty is now. Where's shipbuilding? Where are we going to train our people? Where are our apprentices going to come? Where are we going to build ships that we're really proud of? Maybe autonomous ships and AI and cyber and whatever. How are we going to do that for the next century as well as our own? And I was quite interested we'd come together. But we don't understand, ladies and gentlemen. Let me give you an example, and this, I can give you a bit of dirt here. So I was NATO Maritime Commander. I had a brilliant boss. His name was Scap Scaparotti, five-star general, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, top bloke. He was a ranger. And, and he, had, he had been a commander in Korea. He was now in Europe. He was going to go outside, albeit they wanted him to be chief of the general staff. And he was chosen by the president to go and talk to the Russians. Because if you remember, the, um, uh, the Arab world was in riot, Syria was happening, and we really didn't like what Syria was, happen except what Syria was happening. We had um, the Donbass had been invaded, Crimea had been invaded. I was deploying lots and lots of ships into the Black Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean. And if you remember, Greece and Turkey were sparring, sending migrants across each other as a political weapon. So SCAP was sent out to go and talk to their head of, head of defense, uh, Valery Karazimov. And, and in that build-up, you can imagine the industry of that brief. You know, it's at every level builds up. And, and he called in his commanders just before he went, and he said, right, have we missed anything? We locked ourselves away in a very secret cabin for about a day, and we dress rehearsed him. And we had brilliant Russianists, we had brilliant Chinese specialists, we had brilliant body language specialists all helping us, and it was, you know, it was a massive Game of Thrones. It was bloody exciting, actually. And then somebody asked, do they understand what we're telling them? And we all went, uh, yeah, I think so. And we then did a character profile of them, and not one of them had been to the West, talked to any Western people or anything like that. None of his group had any Western orientation at all. They spoke Soviet, and only Soviet. And we went, oh, shit, how do we talk Soviet? We've forgotten how to do that. And then we looked at ourselves. Now, I'm a bit of a Russianist, but I haven't been to Russia. You know, I've learned Russian and gone on Russian ships, and that's the limit of my Russian. And, and I had more than anybody else. And we suddenly realized we weren't just in the wrong dialect, we were talking past each other. And so it was a really uncomfortable moment that we realized, probably for the last year, we had been doing things in a very sort of sexy, pompous way, and the Russians were just going past and punching us. And no wonder we didn't understand each other, because we came from very different places. And for me, that was a real revelation. Now, the dirt is, so Scat went into this room, Grasimov was opposite side of him, lots of flowers around, hidden microphones everywhere, you know, cameras everywhere. And, and when you go and do this thing, you don't see it, but Scat has a, um, it's like a file of facts. And he has on one side, give him a punch, and then three lines of stuff, just to jog his memory, and it's all tabbed up. And, and you go through a really tiresome process of turning over the pages. I think you're being nasty. I think you're being nasty. Turn over the page. And it's, it's, it's just very dull. And Scat realized it was going nowhere. So he closed his book to the consternation of his team. There's about five people there. Closed his book and goes, oh, I'm not, not bothered with this. Are you a dad? Karazimov looked horrified and said, oh, yeah. Are you a grandfather? Yeah, so am I. Are you a soldier? Yeah. Are you a general here? Yeah. Well, what the hell are we talking like this for? And Grazanov went onto his notebook, I'd like to talk about you know, milk chocolate or something like that. And, and, and Scap said, no, stop, stop. We're about to go to war. 
Let's have a conversation about stuff. And the two great men put their books down, got rid of half the people in the room, and had a proper conversation. And of course, it was all minuted to the 19th degree. But, that, but we need to do more of that to break down the narrative and talk to people. But we need to understand that we're talking past each other. And if you look at the speeches that happened on the 21st of February in Moscow and Warsaw, General Biden and Warsaw, Putin uh, doing his extravaganza for about 15 hours, longer than me in, in, in uh, Moscow. Actually, I could do 15 hours, that would be cool. 16 hours? We'd go for a record. Um, uh, we, uh, it, 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 we're not just t talking past each other. We have such terrifyingly different worldviews. And, and, you know, and we need to work out how we can close the gap. And I think this is where we need to start as a maritime. So let me rotate us from grand strategy and then take you down to the, na uh, the, to the Russian Navy and stuff. Now, the Russian Navy were absolutely hit by the crisis that happened once the Soviet Union broke down. They were disinvested into such a point, and this is a true story, that a destroyer coming back through the sewers broke down, and they had to cut off the winches, and they had to cut off the material and sell them to fix their propeller to get them home. So they arrived with nothing on the deck, because they had sold all the bits and pieces along the way to whoever would buy them. Whoever buys a, you know, a Russian missile system, great, it sits in the garden, looks cool. Um, but, but actually, that was the state they were in. But the only thing they invested in were their submarines. And they put more money, more money by a whole dimension into their submarines than ever we did. We went into a bit of a trough, and they kept on spending. So from a low le level, um, back in about 1960, 70, their boats are really quite cool now. And ours are cool and getting better, but our new submarines are rolling out. So there's, we've had a bit of a judder, and the Americans have had a bit of a judder too. And so when we talk about the Russians, what they've done is they've invested in their submarines, cool. They've invested in their small warships, cool. And on every small warship, they've put masses of weapon systems, all of which work. And they've proof tested them in Syria. So you may have heard the caliber missile system. I've sat in HMS Duncan, sitting off um, Syria, watching them and they're firing salvos of eight or nine missiles. They're doing it because they want to give kick shit out of, excuse me, they want to, um, excuse me, they want to um, uh, attack, attack the enemy, but actually what they're also doing is they want to prove their weapon systems and prove that they work. And they've done that very successfully. Now, the Russian Navy are a component part of Russian strategy. And the Russian Navy are there to do two, three things, sorry, not two things, three things. The first thing they do is to harry the Western fleets, to make it very difficult for us to do our business. Whenever there is a British aircraft carrier or an American aircraft carrier, there will be a Russian ship in the way. Whenever there is some activity going on, it happened to me over and over again, there will be two or three Russian ships just getting in your head. And they do. They disturb us because they don't want to have it our own way. The second thing Russians do is they want strategic advantage in the big open water, in the Atlantic, in the Pacific, and in the Indian Ocean, and in the high north. And so there is a battle under the water taking place of the Russian Navy with very, very advanced submarines and very advanced watercraft doing business that is normally not reported anywhere. And the third thing they want to do is they want to curry favor and influence around the world. And if you think that the Russian fight is around Ukraine and Putin is only concerned about Ukraine, think again. Uh, the Russians are investing more in West Africa than every, any other nation. They're investing more in Latin America than any other nation. They've already set up two bases around Indonesia and out into the Coral Islands and, and islands in, 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 out into the Pacific and they are very active, visiting them, them with their warships from Vladivostok, or warships from the North Sea Fleet, or warships from the Baltic Fleet. It is anything but a Ukrainian battle. It is a battle of influence, of changing the narrative their way, of making sure that the Western values are disturbed and invested in, and they're very good at doing that. And they see that as part of a long-term process. They see that as, as knocking us off out of the Security Council. 
they see that as opening up the waterways for Russian influence, not for Western influence. And they've been doing that for a long time. So what do we think about the Russians? What do we think about understanding? I'll, I'll close this part of the speech by saying uh, we have got to understand that now we're not in a bipolar world. It's not us against the Russians because the Chinese have a vote, the Iranians have a vote, and other people have a vote. But we have to consider, in a way we've never considered before, all the facets of maritime power. We've got to understand education, we've got to understand business, we've got to understand academia, and we've got to understand policy and start to draw it together. And the other thing we've got to understand is what other people think. What do West African nations think of us and our disinvestment in them? And what do they think of the Russian investment? And why are they cross with us? They deserve to be cross with us. We've not got that right. Why are they getting purchased in Latin and America? Why are the Latin American countries irritated with the Americans? You know, maybe we need to have a very much more thoughtful view of the world and how we take things forward. And if you think about this game of chess and Jenga, think of chess of, is what we want to do. We want to think about how we make the world better, but we have to realize that the winner will be the guy who plays Jenga, because that Jenga column will fall and then will distract us, and that's a really big deal. Now, so what is it? It's people, 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 and it's understand, understand, understand. And I think, sir, you got to learn that the hard way through the Battle of the Atlantic and the fight to understand what the sea meant, what the weather meant, what it meant to face up to very impressive Russian, uh, German submarines and how you competed with them. And also, you need to understand that if you want your values to win, there's an element of resolve and courage that actually we probably don't have in UK at the moment. And I wonder if we have it in the West. Are we tough enough? Are we tough enough to really stand up for what we care for? We had a lot of conversations at the end of my time in command when we talked about uh, the cost and the value of freedom. And, and this wasn't an American conversation. It actually started off in France. And it was a uh, French thinkers who were just going, you know, what are we prepared to sacrifice? Are we prepared to have very cold winters? Are we prepared not to have the second holiday? Are we prepared to give up some of our holiday homes in order to be secure and looking after people? Now, if I haven't frightened you about the Russian and, and got you diving into history books and grammar, if nothing else to check, I'm talking rubbish. Let me just briefly touch on Liverpool and, and Western Approaches Command and the Second Battle of the Atlantic, because it's quite a good dip, really. So we all know the story. At 1940, 41, it was going badly. Our allied tactics were not working. And the, Rush, uh, and, and the Germans seemed to be getting into our convoys, and the carnage was just immeasurable. Uh, indeed, if you look at, and I don't know if anybody's looked at it, but if you, if you talk to the um, uh, uh, Imperial War Museum and ask them for some narrative, they do little short narratives on battles, and they send them to you free, and ask for our food state in the autumn of 1941-42. UK almost ran out of food. We were about to go to sub-diet rationing because we didn't have the solid food and the proteins and the mass we needed to keep the country going. And, and there is a really interesting graph of dockyard workers whose workloads dropped right off. And actually, Liverpool is the test case. They were working at 70% of the capacity that they were at the beginning of 1940-41 because they just weren't eating enough uh, um, carbohydrates and proteins and weren't having enough calories. But in 1942, almost in a spirit of desperation, this motley group were dragged up from Portsmouth to, um, to Liverpool, and they were a motley group. Uh, the boss, Gilbert Roberts, wasn't an easy man. He had had tuberculosis, he had been in command of a frigate, he had had tuberculosis and had been, dr not drummed out the Navy, but he had to leave the Navy on health. He'd ended up as a postman somewhere down in Cornwall in Devon. Um, and then he had done a, he, I think he had been an auxiliary policeman and he was thoroughly fed up about life. I think he'd got divorced. I think his life wasn't in a great space. But he was a gamer and he was an, an intellectual. And they realized that his ability to game might be helpful. And at the same time, women were being recruited in to do clerical jobs. And he just happened to have 
a bunch of really clever young ladies. I mean, they were 17, 18, 19, 20. And, and they went up en masse to Liverpool, and they started to work out how to do or why things weren't working. And it was them who realized the submarines were drifting in under the convoys and sitting in the convoy lanes till night fell. And then they just absolutely destroyed the convoys. And they wouldn't, wouldn't run away. They would sit there until the search for them went away. And then they would drift off. Really, really clever. Bloody brave tactics, but really clever. But Watu worked this out. But Watu didn't arrive with a sort of hurrah or anything like that. All the Commodore, Commodore captains and the Navy captains were furious that this weirdo and his girls were telling them how to fight tactics. I mean, it was really unpleasant, and they refused to come to the briefing sessions, and they wouldn't do anything. But initially, Percy Noble attended, and Percy Noble tried to fight against one of the girls and tried to have a sea battle against her, and she beat him. And, and he said, right, right, you bugger. Okay, well, clearly you know your trade. And then he ordered two or three of the commanders to come and fight their little games. And they lost as well. And slowly, the great names, the Walkers, the Gretons, the McIntyres, realized there was something in this. And have you ever seen any pictures of how this worked? So imagine a floor like this. And around the edges were canvas screens with a tiny little dot in it. And they were on a step. And the captain of the ship was allowed to stand on the step looking through this tiny pinhole, but that's all he could see of the battle. And then, a bit like um, a dice game, he would throw his move and the ships would move. And then somebody else would do them, but the German would make a move, and then he would make a move, and then the German would make a move. But he couldn't see the battle, just like you can't see a battle in real life. And they freaked out because they thought they were on the bridge looking out. They thought they could see the battle. And of course, they didn't understand that they had to step back and think through a different way. And, and once that happened, once this perspective and this understanding took place, then, funny old thing, they started to do different tactics. And if I've, I've been researching this all my life. I've been really interested by it. But uh, Simon Parkin, in his book, the, uh, the Game of Birds and Wolves, talks about it. It's a really good book if you haven't got it. It's a really good book about feminine en enablement, and that's not women. It's, it's how young people who are talented can be released to do stuff. But it's also written in a lovely way that makes you read it. it he's a proper journalist. So I think I'm at my end, and I don't want to bore you anymore. 13 hours will kill me dead. I'm sure there's a glass of wine with somebody. It will most certainly kill you dead. But let me bring a couple of things to a hold. We are where we, well, we are, aren't we? We, we, we? we are living the life we have. We're in a position we had. We didn't choose it, but to, um, uh, to sort of take that wonderful quote from the film Zulu, when a young lad asks the regimental sergeant major, why are we here, sir? He says something like, just because we are. You know, this is what we're facing. We just happen to be here now. But we're not in a great position. Our planet is already challenged to its limits. We, as a country, are not, um, uh, are not in a terribly strong economic position. And I'm afraid we're not at peace. We're not at peace because in other spectres, at sea, in space, in cyber, and in academia, we are wrestling, if you want to call it that. We are at war, if you want to call it that. We are challenged by an opponent who thinks differently from us. And they are taking action daily against us. The National um, Digital Crime Reference published last year that we, 100, 191 attacks to critical British infrastructure took place last year. 191. That's trying to take out hospitals or nuclear power plants. That's, that's trying to shut down banks, or it's trying to change your school's education so, and delete all the files. 191 of those. So I would argue, and I would argue in the spirit of the Battle of Atlantic lectures and a spirit to understand and learn from each other, that we've got to change. We've got to, just like the Battle of Atlantic, start to think differently. We need to harness different people together to have that conversation, the young and the old, the pink and the blue, the spotted, the dotted, the gray, the black. It doesn't matter who you are. You all have a voice. We've got to bring those voices together in a new way with an intent and a resource that we've never done before. If we can do that, the UK, if we can do that, Liverpool, then golly, you know, we can turn things around. And I think, standing here, the first lecture of the Battle Atlantic series, I hope that understanding will creep through 
and maybe that spirit will continue. Thank you very much indeed. We'll say thank you again in a moment, but uh, there is an opportunity for questions or observations. Oh, I have got one to start with. Oh, and one over there. Um, John first, please, with one on the front row there. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I enjoyed that very much. Um, I, when you mentioned about the um, uh, nourishment aspects of the dock workers, I thought you were going to um, make the connection with the work of Lord Woolton. Uh, from Liverpool, who was minister during the war, and who calculated with colleagues from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine what the calories were going to be needed for the nation. And that formed the basis for the contracting for what we were getting from Canada and from the States, and obviously, which then had to be safeguarded to come across the Atlantic. But the role of Lord Woolton in this is an interesting side story. But you see, but absolutely, I'm sorry not to mention him, you know, and there are lots of other people. The dynamics of working out what supplies we need was an extraordinary thing, of Lord, which Lord Wilson was part of. But this is where you need different voices, and you need different skills, and you need different competencies. You know, and, and absolutely, and this is where wonderful universities like John Moores and the University of Liverpool and all the rest of that have such a place to say. But as does business. I know I'm a converted businessman, I'm a fish out of water really. But, but lots of businesses try, are trying to do the right thing. They just need the lead. So it's how do we integrate that and have a common voice? But thank you. Without trying to put a downer on your fantastic lecture, is Whitehall going to look after the veterans from all, you know, the history of veterans coming back from conflict? If you're going to recruit people into the services, then we need to show we are properly looking after veterans. And that's not aimed at you, sir. That's just a, a, a general comment. So, so I need to declare my hand here. Um, I, I'm a vice patron of a charity called the Employment Charity uh, that was a charity that was formed after the Battle of Waterloo to do exactly that, to look after the veterans, because the Crown wasn't. And I'm very proud to announce that I'm also about to become national president of the Royal British Legion. And, and one of the reasons I've agreed to become pres uh, president of the Royal British Legion is I'm deeply concerned about exactly your issue. Uh, we don't look after veterans. Um, we absolutely don't. Uh, we praise them from time to time because it's politically convenient to do, but the consistent care of our, our serving, if, if we didn't have the charities that care, would be woeful. And I think there is a political class that understands that. Tom Tugganhat is wonderful. Johnny Mercer understands that deeply. It, it always comes down to resourcing, and we always have the resources on the bottom of the pile. I'd love to say it's going to be different. You know, I'd love to say, crikey, I'm a veteran, you're a veteran. You know, lots of us are veterans. I don't know. We'll see. But, but it's, it's a worry. I, I think, I, I mean, veterans is a vex problem, and I'm not, I'm, I can't talk about it because that's just not my bag. We're being forced to look more creatively of how we employ people, and I don't know if people have heard this. We can't pull people in through the door at 18. There's just not the people to be had, and they don't want to join at 18. But we can pull people through the door at about 35, 36. We can pull people through the door at 45, because people have had a career and then want to come in. And so the RAF are pathfinding something at the moment where on air stations, it doesn't matter how old you are to become a, um, a, a member of the RAF. It depends on what skills you have and what skills you bring. And, and that wisdom and that experience, I think, is a fabulous thing. It will change the shape and sizes of parades. God, you'll have people like me with pot bellies marching around. That's not good, is it? But, but actually, maybe we will just have a different dynamic of talent and maybe that will lead into a different view of what a veteran is a veteran is still productive you know because you've you've been a copper and we've been in the health service or we've been in whatever industry you've been and now you want to spend 10 years in, in the armed forces and then you're going to do something else 
So I'm not scared. I, I, I think the way things are changing mirrors society. Maybe that's a good thing, though it feels a bit uncomfortable to an old dog like me. Hi. I'm Jim Bellew. Uh, I'm a former maritime engineer. I also am a businessman who spent a lot of time in Russia. Um, the Battle of the Atlantic and World War II were major events that Russia was a major part of. Um, you mentioned the, 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 the gap between us and Russia today and how we have guilt on that part. My uh, question really is, shouldn't we be inviting Russia to participate in this memorial process of the Battle of the Atlantic? They were a major part of it. And wouldn't that invitation be a potential bridge to Russia to open up discussions about where we're going in the future rather than just looking at the past. If you want an opportunity to, to ring their bell, I, I spent a lot of time doing business in Russia and everywhere you went, they took you and showed you the World War II or the, the war memorials. They were massive, they were everywhere. Their sacrifice was enormous in World War II. Oh, yeah. 20 million Russians versus less than a million Americans and less than a million Brits is the ratios. It, it was immense. We should recognize that. They never they got shortchanged after World War II. And we alienated them when the, when the Soviet bloc fell down. We left them hanging out there. If you want to make overtures, wouldn't the Battle of Atlantic, then what we're doing now be an opportunity? So, so Jim, I agree with you completely. I, I think the national policy line at the moment is you cannot you cannot share something like a memorial when they are attacking uh, a, a sovereign land unprovoked. Um, the national position is at the moment Russia, uh, or no, wrong, but we're using the wrong language, once Putin's regime, because Russia is different, once Putin's regime pull back from Ukraine, then everything is back on again. And, and as a member of a community uh, who talked to the Russians right up until the last minute, and then talk through the Turks to the Russians after the last minute. Um, you know, we desperately, desperately, desperately tried to, to keep fingers of communication going on. So, so that is taking place. But I think the national policy is right that, that while Ukraine is suffering the losses it's suffering, um, you, just, you just can't, you can't entertain other conversations because there's no boundary. So. Uh, Captain Peter Woods, Hello, Peter. Uh, pre in a previous life, Ocean Convoy Commodore Sackland one, but a very interesting lecture. But I'd like to go back to diversity. I have, my niece has got an 18-year-old daughter, who through me we got her. She's applied to join the navy. She spent three days on an A boat up in the site. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Then we had all the problems about what was going on in submarines. So now she's decided she's going to she's going to become a skimmer instead. But she loved the submarine life, wanted to do nuclear engineering. Uh, what's going to be happening? What sort of thing does that send out to young girls, in particular women, about going on things like submarines? And I've not seen anything from the Navy about how they're hammering down on this sort of action on board. Ah, right. So, so whenever you take... A, so, so this is a really dark story, and I'll share some dirty washing here, because I think it's important. Whenever we've gone through a change as seismic as taking women to sea, and it shouldn't be seismic, but it is, you have a period of perturbation. I was on the second ship to take women to sea um, when they joined the surface fleet, um, and we were given the most ridiculous le lectures about not touching and women's bodies and all that ruddy stuff. And, and um, it took about six months to settle down, because if you do lock girls and boys in a metal box, funny old thing, rabbits happen, but it just, you know, but it calmed down. And now, and now I wouldn't go on a ship that wasn't mixed because of the talent flow and all the rest of that. What happened in submarines, uh, and again, I'm not a serving officer, so I caveat this, but, but we found out that uh, some nastily inappropriate behavior being taking place. The first sea lord initially uh, was told that it had been cauterized and, and was okay. Um, he wasn't, because he's a, he's a really impressive man, and he's a very, very strong moral compass, he wasn't happy with that. So he uh, investigated a very private review of what was happening in submarines, and unfortunately, 
we found some really nasty stuff was. Um, nobody who has been involved in that nasty stuff is serving in the Navy at all anymore. And, and one or two people, I have to now be really, really careful, are going through a legal process that will lead probably into something. So, we, so Admiral Ben flatly refused to accept the paper over the cracks and all the rest of that. What it's done is forced us to review every single procedure of being at sea. What's quite interesting is just like your um, niece and daughter, um, we interviewed in private in uh, special conditions every woman serving in a submarine now. And every single woman said, please, please, please don't take me off. I'm loving it. It's brilliant. I don't want to go. I'm a submariner. I don't care about being cooped up. I don't care about being lots of blokes. It's the most exciting life I've ever lived. So 100% of women asked to remain where they are, and they get reviewed. I think, I can't, Phil, I don't know if you know, but it gets reviewed every cycle. So grotty story, bloody human behavior, nasty. You, you, it, we reflect the world, but there's a load of horrible stuff out there. And, and I'm afraid, you know, like every other institution, we've got a wash of it. I'd love to say it's gone away. It won't have. You know, you mow the grass and you try to dumb it down. But, um, but I think you will find that things are, A, very much better, if not rosy, and things are very, very sensibly considered. Don't be, actually, no, do be a skimmer. Don't be in a submarine. Don't be in a submarine. Good evening. Hi. My, my name is Robert Owen. I'm a retired architect with no military background whatsoever. Phew. Good evening. At what point did the senior military chiefs in the UK realize that uh, Russia was going to invade the Ukraine? I ask that because until it happened, the government was reassuring the media, and therefore us, that it was merely a buildup of military troops um, for exercise purposes. Um, that's a really good question that I'm trying to think how I answer. Um, you would... Uh, you would be very, very proud of the UK's intelligence services and our judgments. And indeed, I would recognize that um, probably because of the UK intelligence services, the Ukrainians were positioned in the way they were. You have to occupy different narratives, um, but we knew what was going on. Oh no, wrong. We had a really good inkling of what was going on. And that allowed us to work with the Americans in a way uh, that was enormously constructive. And we were able to set up some asymmetries around Ukraine uh, that turned out to be massively successful. Um, there are other nations, and this is public knowledge, so I can do it, who while the military were advising their politicians of one course of action, the politicians refused to accept it. France was one of them. Sarkozy thought he thought genuinely and honorably he had a private line to Putin, and he thought genuinely and honorably that Putin was telling him the truth. Um, you know, I'm reminded of what Churchill said, that you don't negotiate with a tiger with your head in its mouth. Um, uh, 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 you know, we thought differently. Just to build on that, to, to give you an idea of what British intelligence and what we can be proud of, because of the British-American axis, we uh, managed to, to buy, convince um, Elon Musk to, to reorientate all of his low Earth satellites over Ukraine uh, all the time. So there was total coverage of all the borders and all the boundaries uh, with high density cameras. So we knew what was going on. And we then took the agreement so that there were no false stories, that we'd release every single piece of intelligence, even top secret code word, curly whirly eyes only, we'd release it to the media. We made it absolute, and, we, and, and if you go on the internet and you know what to type in, you can see almost anything about Ukraine. And the reason we did that is now there's no secrets. If there's a Russian column coming down the road, every single Russian commander is looking on his mobile, not on his mobile phone, because you'd get tracked, but on a, a device, and can see where the tanks are. And, and, and the same right across Ukraine and right across the West. This is a seismic, um, you know, beyond seismic. This is a, a, an astonishing change of the way we do our business. And then the third component of that 
was we used a French AI intelligence company. Um, you can imagine if, if somebody decides to fire a missile to the point it hits you, you have a period of time. It's called the OODA loop, uh, the operation decision making loop. And, and if it's a ship, it may be a minute. It, if you're on a land target, it may be about 15, 20 seconds. A, a commander on the ground can't assimilate the data fast enough to, to tell him what's going on. So we, we have used AI to narrow down the options for the commander. He just gets told, missile, left or right? And he can go, I can, left, go left. And he can get his people out of trouble. So really good British intelligence leading to really good Western intelligence. Uh, conviction of politicians, I hate to say it, but Boris Johnson and Ben Wallace got it right. You know, God. Um, they got it right. Um, and some very, very big strategic calls by them. Uh, use of technology cleverly and then using new technology, AI and data in a new way, gave Ukraine an ability to fight those first three, four weeks. And that was pivotal. Once they were three, four weeks in, their battle plans kicked in. But they weren't overwhelmed in those first three or four weeks. So the narratives are different because that's security. But actually, we can be quite proud of ourselves and our part in, in all of that. And I think I can tell you that. And if I can't, I've messed up. It's on the live stream, so uh, yeah, nobody can check knows. it later. Uh, Thank you ever so much. That last question rather brought into focus that it's one continuous narrative that's taken us from the Battle of the Atlantic 80 years ago through to where we are today, and that some of the same issues resonate, and um, that hopefully, in other ways, we have moved on. This is, as uh, Sir Clive has said, the first lecture of the Battle of the Atlantic series. There will be others, so I do encourage all of you to go on to the Battle of the Atlantic website, that's battleoftheatlantic.org.uk, and uh, if you go to events, you'll see the other events that are coming up. You can uh, go to Bootle Town Hall to see uh, more about Johnny Walker. You can come to lectures here. We've got events, particularly over the Battle of the Atlantic weekend, 26th to the 28th of May. The information is all there. Please also look at social media, promote, tell your friends, bring them down here. It's uh, something that should unite this city, but it's also an international thing. So please do use all the social media channels available and word of mouth to get people uh, to take part in this very important commemoration. Um, in a moment, we're going to do something else after the live stream has stopped. But um, before that, I'd just like, again, to thank Sir Clive very much for his time and his speech this evening. <laughs>